Welcome to Florence School of Regulations online event. Today we will focus on uh, methane emissions, uh, more precisely to reduce, how to reduce uh, methane emissions using the framework of the European Green Deal. We will try to look on the overall situation with methane emissions. Uh, we will focus on the measures that could be anticipated uh, with the support of the European Green Deal and also how to get public more aware of the issue and the results that have, need to be achieved. I have four experts today, excellent experts on uh, that will help us to move through this topic. Uh, I have Monica Sigri from the European Commission. I have Tanya uh, Makes Fernandez from Enagas. I have Poppy Kalesi from the Environmental Defense Fund and Maria Olchak from the Florence School of Regulation. Uh, the last weeks have been, as usually, quite active also in energy field. And, but one of the, for me, is a big announcement that came from BP seems that like a change of, of, of some particular approach by the companies because some companies always well have been supportive to fight climate change. But in practical steps, the internal activities have been not so strong. And BP make a very strong announcement also about methane, saying that by 2023 they will measure all the major sites uh, for methane emissions, and also they will cut methane emissions down by 50%. And I will start with Poppy asking, well, does it really mix, make a step change in the fight against uh, methane uh, uh, emissions and how you would evaluate where we are today and what are the dynamic. Thank you very much, Andris, and, and hi to everyone. Good morning. Um, I would say it is without doubt uh, the most ambitious commitment we've seen to date. And the BP announcement is a game changer. It has changed the conversations in the boardrooms. And it has changed, it has really upped the ante for all the oil and gas peers who want to transform while performing. I want to share with you a few facts to put this BP announcement in context. Um, the first fact that we don't speak very much of in the European context is that molecules account for 70% of the EU's final energy consumption. At the global level, molecules account for 80% of final energy use. Even in the highest electrification scenarios, molecules will account for anything between 40 to 60%. The, the fact of the matter is that we don't actually know what BP will deliver. Um, so we are looking forward to September for more specific commitments. But what we know is that their commitment doesn't come out of the blue. The commitment comes in a context where while the business itself, exploration and production of hydrocarbons, is still a very lucrative business, the industry as a whole has lost $400 billion in value over the past four years. So I do not think that the industry is going to go away, but its business model and what it delivers is under serious pressure by both investors and society alike. So Bernard Looney's statement leaves no room um, for doubt on that. Uh, he specifically said, we are aiming to earn back the trust of society. We have got to change and change profoundly. Looking back at what the chairman of BP, Helge Lund, said, a, Exactly a year ago, he stated, we believe our strategy is consistent with the Paris goals, and he did not want to entertain any questions about extending BP's responsibility to scope three emissions, to the emissions created by those who consume BP's products. The contrast could not be starker. So, as you rightly said, Andres, this is a critical, uh, a, a new normal in terms of setting the ambition because on, on methane, because the fourth top priority of BP in this transformation 
is to install methane measurements at all of their major oil and gas processing sites by 2023. And that's important because 2023 is a near-term target. It's not something that they promised for 2050 or 2030. It's something that they promised to do now. The other thing is that they promised to reduce the methane intensity of their operations by 50%. So within a year, we've seen more and faster change than we have seen in the past 20 years. So why is that? Of course, one explanation, as I said before, is the growing pressure from investors and activists. McKinsey has recently put, recently put the cost of reputational risk at about 30% of the value of a company. And globally, there is growing demand for transparency, accountability, and action. Both society and investors want to see that companies and, and engage credibly with their emissions. Because of the size of BP, and I say this because many say that, yeah, well, what's new? Repsol has taken the same commitments, very ambitious. Well, it's not the same size of a company. Because of its size, the announcement has changed the conversation in boardrooms. And it has seriously challenged Shell, Total, ENI and Equinor's climate commitment, who will need to show um, that they can step step up. So concretely, what this means for the oil and gas industry, I think, is the following. Number one, that voluntary commitments and standards are not strong. They have neither curbed the global rise of methane emissions, nor have they offered more transparency over whether companies do what they say that they do. So as things stand, Every company can report their emissions in a way that makes them look better than their peers. So supporting strong climate policy through specific and sustained advocacy will be a matter of business success. And I think Bernard Looney has recognized this in his announcement. He did, um, he did suggest that hiding behind trade associations, which is something BP has, accused, has been accused of in the past, will no longer be an option. The second thing oil and gas companies will need to do as a matter of commercial success is that committing to achieve net zero by 2050, including scope three emissions, will have to be accepted as a new normal. As I said before, one way to tell if a company means business is whether they set themselves mid-term targets for 2025 and 2030 to align with the trajectory of the Paris Agreement. And the last thing that we'll be looking for companies who really mean business is a commitment to deploy robust monitoring, reporting, and verification and technology deployment across their assets, including non-operated joint ventures, to control and cut methane emissions. And these actions will tell us which companies are serious about performing while transforming. As, a, as an example, the credibility of the industry CEO-led oil and gas climate initiative is eroding because it has failed to demonstrate progress that lives up to the urgency and the magnitude of the task at hand. So unless they commit by the end of this year to cut methane across assets, including their environmentally embarrassing assets um, if that are hidden in kind of non-operated joint ventures, I think patience of both investors and society will run dry. And, and this is my understanding of the state of play. Thank you, Pope. Uh, it's it's uh, not sometimes it's understood that uh, fight against methane emissions should be only done on production sites, but that's actually the whole value chain is involved. And I somehow really admire European gas industries that really started already more than a year ago started to to mobilize. Uh, say nearly a year ago, there was a report how oil gas industry could contribute to fight against. Uh, uh, methane emissions, and they have been continuous process. And one of the person at the center, uh, Tanya, you have been uh, well steering as much as you can, definitely well being one person, but also seeing how it evolves and how do you evaluate uh, how the process in Europe is going, uh, what is the industry ambition, and what could be achieved out of this, Tanya. Okay, so thank you very much. So first of all, good morning to everybody. So Chiara, I'm trying to find my slides, so I cannot see them. So here we go. Okay, so as the next one. 
So as, as Andres has mentioned, in, in October 2018, GIM Macogas uh, got the invitation to to perform a report on the potential ways the gas industry can contribute to the reduction of the methane emissions and also to present the results in the next Madrid Forum in, in June 2019. So it was a very ambitious project with a very tight agenda. So GI and Marco Gas involve representatives from the entire gas chain, so from production to utilization, including biomethane plants. And I can tell you that it was really amazing and unbelievable the amount of contributions that we got, all the willingness of the gas industry to contribute, to collaborate, and to and to support us. And, and so after just doing the analysis of all the information that we got, so I can tell you that methane emissions management and reduction is not a new topic for the gas industry. So from the beginning has been done for safety reasons and in some cases also for economic reasons. And during the last years, uh, also the one of the main drivers has been the, the environmental aspects. So the reduction of methane emissions is among the top priorities of the of the European gas industry, and we see it as an opportunity to contribute to, to achieving the Paris Agreement targets. And so what happened after the publication of, of this report? So the report was published in June 2019, and it includes a list of challenges and gaps. And so GIE and Marco Gas, with, together with representatives from the entire gas chain, have been uh, just uh, doing the analysis of, of all these uh, challenges and gaps. And based on that, we have prepared an action plan uh, covering the complete gas chain and related to the detection, identification, quantification, reporting, and monitoring and mitigation of, of methane emissions. So this action plan has more than 50 projects and it, it, it is published on the, on the GIE website. So it's available for all of you. So in some cases, GIE and Marcogas are, are leading some of these projects. So for example, the, the assessment of methane emissions for transmission and distribution. So this document is already published on the Marcogas website. And we are at the moment uh, having some discussions with CEN in order to see how this document can become a European standard. And another project, for example, is the guidelines for methane emissions reduction target uh, setting. And in other cases, we are uh, supporting and collaborating with some initiatives, for example, with the with the consultant that uh, have been appointed by DGNR in order to perform a study on limiting methane emissions in the energy sector. So we organized a meeting with them in December and also with some representatives from the industry. And in February this year, also we organized a, a workshop with the consultants and, and also representatives from the, from the entire gas chain to provide input and clarification in the case that, that it was uh, needed. So the gas industry is really motivated to contribute and to collaborate. So GIA and Marco Gas are also signatories of the methane guiding principles. And so, for example, at the moment we are developing some best practices document for for midstream for the midstream part of the of the gas chain. We are also collaborating with the oil and gas methane partnership in order to ensure that the methane reporting framework that they are developing can be can be used for the mid and downstream segments. And in other cases we are just following the 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 development. And so this action plan is an a, a, live, a live document. It is published on the GI website and it will be ad updated on frequent basis. And in parallel to all this, a, a series of dissemination activities and training programs a, have been organized. So for example, in November last year, we organized at the, at the European Parliament a, a workshop. We also organized a training session with energy community and the methane guiding principles. So we had more than 70 participants and and this was uh, mainly for for energy community countries and southeastern uh, European companies. And so GIA and Marco Gas really wants to contribute to building a culture of non-tolerance to methane emissions in, in the gas sector. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I, I, I believe that all of the most difficult questions when it comes to the big scale policies is the need for regulation especially when the industry makes its voluntary action. Because then you say, well, they are doing anyhow, and perhaps the regulation is not needed. And definitely decision on 
whatever regulation you make, it is will be criticized because you need resources for regulate, you put a straight jacket, and there is more bureaucracy. And uh, the perception is always that in meat-end regulations, they have been not too much done. But actually, they have been, and they have been a meeting in uh, International Energy Agency at the beginning of this year, and Florence School of Regulation all collaborated in, in making this event, that actually there are regulatory approaches already now in quite many countries. And Maria, what is the main conclusions? Where this regulation goes and where could it could be improved? What are your impressions about it? Because you have studied uh, this regulation in some countries quite extensively. Please. Uh, thank you, Andris, and welcome to 81 participants at that moment. Um, so it's a great number. Um, and so uh, let me start by uh, saying that um, I think from the meeting uh, organized uh, by uh, International Energy Agency with uh, uh, incorporation also with Florida School of Regulation, it's clearly visible that the regulators uh, recognize the fact that, that the global methane emissions are rising um, based on the scientific research and uh, the recent estimate of the global methane budget uh, for the period 2000-2012. The atmospheric methane concentrations have been rising much faster than uh, in the past two decades. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that regulators also uh, recognize is the fact that um, um, oil and gas industry, um, it's uh, of course contributing to, 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 to this increase, uh, but um, uh, luckily the emissions from the oil and gas sector are uh, considered as uh, those that are uh, the, uh, the low hanging fruit. And from, this uh, comes from uh, uh, different uh, points of view, from political, technological and economic. And uh, just to illustrate what I just said, uh, I will try to find, oh perfect, thank you Chiara. So there is a slide that um, uh, the, the graph prepared by the International Energy Agency. Um, the agency prepare, uh, prepared the estimation of the marginal abatement cost curve for oil and gas related uh, methane emissions. And what the graph shows is that uh, with the use of currently available technologies, it is possible to abate around 75% of uh, methane emissions in the oil and gas sector and 40% at no net cost because the cost of implementing technologies would be balanced out by the revenue of uh, selling the safe gas. So this is pretty uh, important. Another thing that comes also uh, from, from the work of International Energy Agency is that uh, the recent report that was presented at the Davos uh, showed that if the companies who want to follow the DP, uh, they should start with uh, reducing their methane emissions uh, and uh, this is um, in the orange part of, of this graph shows um, the, the potential uh, of it. And um, so this um, comes as an introduction and uh, when it comes to the regulations that have been already implemented uh, in different jurisdictions, um, um, we can distinguish two types of regulations. So the first type is the traditional command and control or prescriptive regulation and it could take form of either technology or design um, uh, standards. So, for example, when the regulator uh, specifies that, for example, the companies need to use the vapor recovery units, uh, uh, and the second, uh, the second uh, type within this category is performance-based standards, which is a little bit more flexible because it sets, for example, the venting limits uh, for the certain type of, uh, uh, of uh, facilities, for instance, and uh, the companies can have the uh, more uh, more liberty in the choice of the technologies they want to implement. And this type of regulation has been already implemented in, uh, uh, US, in the US, Mexico and Canada following the trilateral pledge to reduce emissions in oil, from oil and gas sector in those countries by 40 to 45 percent by 2025 uh, starting from the 2000 uh, compared to the 2012. Um, so this is just uh, one type of regulation. Uh, it has the, the advantage that uh, uh, in case the monitoring of emission is pretty costly and difficult, as it is with the methane emissions, this type of regulation should work pretty well because uh, when the companies implement technologies, we can assume that in majority of case, cases it will bring about the reductions. Um, the negative um, uh, side of this type of regulation is that it does not um, create an uh, incentive to innovate because the companies will just use the technologies that were prescribed in the regulation and that's it. 
That's why uh, it is believed that maybe the second type of um, regulatory approach is uh, maybe better for tackling methane emissions. And this is the market-based approach or uh, incentive-based approach. Uh, in that case, the um, producers um, need to uh, are, are somehow incentivized uh, to include the cost of abating methane into their um, investment decisions. Uh, and uh, thanks to this approach, uh, they have more flexibility because they, the companies choose technologies uh, to reduce methane emissions on their own. Uh, and it also lowers down the information bur burden on the uh, regulator. Uh, the disadvantage of this, uh, uh, this uh, approach could be the fact that uh, it should clearly uh, define the level of emissions uh, because it, it will affect the efficiency of the whole system. Uh, and this type of regulation in the form of uh, a, a special uh, tax has been uh, implemented as early as in, 2000, uh, in 1981 in Norway, for instance. So in Norway, uh, there are three uh, tax rates uh, for, for example, the standard cubic uh, meter of, of gas, which is sold on the market. Uh, there is a standard uh, tax, uh, there is a tax rate uh, for the uh, methane that is combusted, uh, and it, uh, there is also the tax rate for the uh, methane that is released to the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this, uh, this type of regulation is, uh, is believed to be pretty successful. Uh, the, 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 the similar, um, uh, similar system works also in Russia. Apart from these two, uh, two uh, uh, approaches, we have also the so-called hybrid approaches. Uh, for instance, the um, uh, information disclosure. And here I would just give one example of the greenhouse gas reporting program that has been launched in 2009 in the US. And here uh, uh, the companies, the facilities, need to report their emissions every year. Uh, and the, those data are uh, publicly available which would give uh, and create uh, additional incentive to reduce their emissions. Uh, apart from that, so just to conclude, uh, I need to also mention non-regulatory approaches. Uh, these are the voluntary actions by the companies. Uh, and I think the, uh, one of the best examples is the, is the natural gas star program uh, currently in place in the US, also dates back to the early 1990s, uh, where the companies um, define their targets on their own uh, they implement uh, reduction uh, actions, uh, and um, then they need to report the, uh, uh, the, the achieved reductions and give some sort of recognition and visibility uh, that, uh, that they really do something about the problem of, uh, of methane emissions. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, the European Green Deal, in my opinion, is definitely the most ambitious project in human history, because if you read the uh, historians of energy no, in no time there have been the change that is so much influenced by one factor, really to decrease the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and there's very clear goals in this direction. And uh, definitely methane is a part of this strategy. And I would like uh, to ask Monica, how do you see this combination of ambition of related to the global goals in uh, the European Green Deal. And I think tomorrow we could expect some uh, next step of decisions or in the nearest time. And also the methane, how, where exactly and how it should be preceded in this strategy, not to be lost, perhaps to be as a front runner. Uh, thank you, Andris, and uh, good day, everyone. Um, yes, as you well, well have said, I mean, the European Green Deal is one of the, the main priorities of this, uh, this commission, if, if not the, one of the most important ones. Um, the, the main, the main uh, reasoning behind it is that it's, it's putting, commission is now putting uh, the fight against climate change at the top of the agenda, and the ambition of the Green Deal is to uh, um, to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. That is a clear path um, or the um, uh, objective uh, to be reached. However, uh, how and in which uh, way it should be reached is, is more, more complex, uh, but it has to be uh, cost efficient um, in any case. Uh, the Green Deal also means that we need to adjust all aspects of policy uh, wherever that is possible. Uh, to reach it, which means that the uh, the roadmap of actions would also would not only concentrate on the energy sector, but would also 
have impact on the circular economy, uh, a new industrial strategy, uh, and it also uh, tries to address biodiversity loss, uh, among others. However, uh, the uh, transition towards the zero carbon future also puts energy in its, in its center, as we know that around 75% of uh, emissions comes from energy production and use. So it, we cannot reach a, a zero carbon uh, future without addressing energy and focusing on energy, on the energy sector uh, in a way. Uh, this transition, however, has to happen without endangering security and of energy supply. Uh, it also has to consider the competitiveness of the EU economy, and it has to be socially fair. So there are many aspects that we need to consider uh, when implementing or when choosing the pathway um, to 2050. Um, in this discussion, we also, as part of, the, uh, of these objectives, we also have to think about uh, or come the topic of the role of gas always uh, pops up. Uh, as far as we can see, um, natural gas will be part of our decarbonization efforts uh, in the short and medium term for as long as it contributes to the 2050 goal. So when it, uh, it replaces coal uh, or oil, uh, then it can be considered a contribution to the um, to decarbonization. And indeed, in 2019, we have observed um, increased coal to gas switch in many, uh, many member states. And that actually contributed to significant reduction of, uh, of emissions. Um, in terms of how it will play out in the longer term, that will have to be seen. Uh, what we what we what we see is that the um, gas will need to uh, will need to decarbonize. Uh, natural gas will need to be de decarbonized if it needs if it wants to be part of the energy mix. Uh, and uh, renewable gases will need to appear uh, and take um, take uh, an important uh, part of the uh, energy mix in the future. Uh, according to our long-term strategies, um, gaseous fuels will still play an important part in 2050. What those gaseous fuels will be, considering that we want to be carbon neutral, uh, technology, uh, technological developments will determine uh, which of those will prevail. And this is what takes me to, to uh, methane emissions, because um, for all this happens, uh, we cannot ignore the, uh, the, the greenhouse gas impact of, of, of methane. Um, the reduction of methane emissions in the energy sector is a priority for us, because uh, methane emissions harm the credibility of gas today as a transition fuel. Uh, and it also, because of that, puts in jeopardy the, uh, the role of renewable or newer decarbonized gases in the future. And that can have a negative inc impact on security of supply. Um, in the Green Deal, we also have an increased ambition for 2030. Um, uh, currently, the greenhouse gas target reduction target is 40 percent, and the Green Deal is exploring the possibilities to uh, increase that ambition to 50 to 55 uh, percent. And what we believe uh, that by addressing CO2, methane, and black carbon together um, can help us achieve this increased uh, ambition. If these, uh, these greenhouse gases are addressed together, according to some of the analyses, we can uh, the the global warming pathway can be reduced by about half a degree, and that can help us keep the um, increase of in global temperatures under the two percent, uh, the two degrees uh, by 2050. And as the energy sector is uh, responsible globally for about one third uh, of man-made methane emissions, and it already has cost-efficient solutions, as we've seen from uh, Maria's presentation, and the energy sector is. Uh, a, a very attractive sector to uh, to act. Um, when it comes to methane emissions, one thing is certain, that the data and knowledge available about methane emissions is uncertain. So uh, because of that, we need to increase the, uh, the knowledge base. PG Energy has its own study uh, to see what is the situation in the EU, whether there are hotspots, whether there are super emitters, how best to uh, address them. 
However, the lack of knowledge and data is not a reason enough to act uh, already today. So the Commission is planning um, uh, to, well, it's actually working on uh, an, an, a strategy to address energy-related methane emissions. This is clearly uh, uh, mentioned, announced in the, uh, in the Green Deal. And uh, because of the uh, lack of data, the first step will be to focus on, on monitoring, reporting, and verification. So uh, we are, in general, usually more towards market-based approaches uh, when it comes to addressing issues uh, of wider policy. However, as was also mentioned before, if we don't have the baseline, it is difficult to come up with, uh, with targets. So until then, we will have to address the, uh, the, the lack of data. Um, the Commission is already, when it comes to these reporting standards, already working under the UN's uh, uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition with companies. The OGMP initiative has been mentioned. Uh, we do believe that the OGMP can deliver uh, a robust uh, and ambitious reporting framework. Our, um, our objective is to extend the scope of that reporting to mid and downstreamers. We have heard from the presentation of Tanya that that, the, that, that kind of dialogue has already started, but we would also like to uh, extend the scope uh, in addition to gas and oil to the coal uh, coal sector, so coal mine uh, methane emissions. We are also working with uh, international partners, uh, both suppliers and buyers, uh, through bilateral and uh, inter uh, multilateral cooperation, uh, in order to raise the issue of methane emissions and to look for potential joint actions, areas of cooperation, uh, and exchange of experiences and best practices in order to globally bring down uh, these methane emissions. So um, I hope that uh, I managed to more or less put uh, our um, intentions uh, into context and how the, uh, the Green Deal uh, or how we can, how strongly we can be part of the Green Deal uh, and uh, move towards uh, carbon neutrality and uh, a lower emission 2030 already. Uh, thank you, Monica. You really opened the door to the main uh, focus of today's discussion. I would just remind participants, now is the right time to also to write the questions. I still have not got any questions from you, but we would really very much that you will get involved or your opinion or your questions on it. And now I will really ask the uh, other three participants of this uh, debate uh, the question, what you would really would like in the European strategy of methane emissions. What is the point that you really think each can't miss? Tanya, perhaps uh, you can start Okay, this. so thank you very much. So I, I have put uh, some ideas in, in the slides. So first I want to start saying that in parallel to policy drivers, I think it's very important to support and to continue with voluntary initiatives such as the methane guiding principles and the oil and gas climate initiative because in my opinion they are very valuable tools. And and also the the involvement of the of the gas industry from the beginning when some policy developments are being undertaken is very important to ensure that the, the final output is uh, doable and feasible for, for us. I fully agree with Monica that we need a, a robust monitoring, reporting and verification uh, system to improve the accuracy of the of the methane emissions data. This data shall be validated and it will help a lot also to have a single reporting framework. All this will contribute to the improvement of the national inventory reports, which quality has been questioned several times. And and also the the, the company should have some flexibility on the best available techniques to be implemented. So the starting point for the companies is different, so therefore they should have the, the flexibility to choose those BITs that reduce more emissions at the lowest cost. And so we have discussed several times uh, here in Europe the possibility to just to set uh, some sectorial target or segment target. So I think that the, the first point for those companies that have not uh, yet set their own methane emissions reduction target 
It should say that they do the analysis internally and they set some targets for the next year. And once we have the information on where the different companies are, we try or yeah, we try to discuss whether it's possible to have a sectorial target or a target per segment. Or so some additional work uh, will be done in, in in this way. And so as it has also been mentioned from from my colleagues, the vast majority of the methane emissions are are uh, yeah produced uh, outside of the borders of the European Union. So therefore, the collaboration with the non-European Union countries is key. So for example, last year uh, in March, uh, we organized a workshop in, in Geneva. It was GIE yeah, Markovas together with UNEC. And we involved uh, companies from Algeria, United States, Nigeria, Qatar. So it was a, a very good uh, scenario for the dialogue with those countries. And I think that this kind of initiatives will be will be key for to ensure that we succeed with, with all this. Thank you. Poppy, what do you think? What Europe should so, do? As I said, um, when we look at evaluating if companies' commitments are credible, I mentioned the importance of committing to mid-term targets aligned with the Paris trajectory, so 2025 and 2030. I believe we would like to see the same commitment um, at the EU and national level as well. So we would like to see a commitment to a methane performance standard within 2025, which we believe should be defined today for compliance in 2025. This should give five years of lead time to anyone wanting to sell gas into the EU market to engage with their methane emissions. This, of course, to enable a methane performance standard in 2025 and to make sure that we have something workable, it is unquestionable that robust MRV needs to be in place within 2023. So enacted and functioning and working. And I wanted to share this slide with you. I don't know if all of you can see um, what we think will be possible in 2023. Um, so to make a methane performance standard possible, we should expect to use more satellite technology. To the right, you can see what the Tropomi instrument, which is sitting with the Dutch Space Agency, can see today, or rather in 2017, in terms of global methane emissions. To the left, um, you can see what MethaneSat, the satellite the Environmental Defense Fund is, um, is building to launch in 2022 what methane sat can see today um, in the testing phase. So the white strokes you can see are, are plumes, are methane plumes that you can see over the Barnett Shale in the US. This to say that when we talk about market-based instruments, I don't expect them to be possible before 2025, but I think we should, any methane strategy should make sure to have a more dynamic an open approach to take in whatever technology development and science knowledge comes our way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Maria? Um, I would say I fully agree with Monica that the first thing to do is to improve the quality of data. This is definitely a problem in the European Union. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm just to, when I was preparing for the debate, I looked at the, the data from a country that I know the best, uh, that is Poland, and I looked at the data coming from the greenhouse gas uh, inventory report, and it's, um, it shows that uh, in, in 2017 in Poland um, there was uh, 45 kilotons of methane um, emitted um, uh, from the oil and gas sector. Uh, I looked also at the data provided by the methane tracker, uh, and uh, it shows that in 2017 in Poland uh, it was actually 80 kilotons of methane emitted. So there is a huge discrepancy between those two data and um, uh, sets of data. And uh, I think this is like the first thing that should be done. And this is not only to point to the case of Poland; it's also common for other uh, countries. For example, there is a recent article on uh, energy uh, post uh, for the case of Canada. Uh, so this is the first thing. The second thing is that we should recognize, and uh, I'm, I'm, I will also refer a little bit to the comment from Carlos, that uh, indeed we need to look at uh, where the emissions uh, come in the EU gas sector. 
Uh, and here we can uh, we can clearly see that uh, um, none of the we, majority of regulations has been implemented uh, in the uh, in the auto majority of regulations has been implemented in the oil and gas um, arm in countries that produces a lot of oil, um, the commodity. Uh, so it, it's mainly like production side. But in the European Union, the, the, the problem is actually on the, the opposite side of the gas value chain. Uh, and here uh, we can clearly say that 75% of, uh, of the emissions comes from the, the transmission distribution storage and LNG uh, terminals. Uh, so this is clearly the problem for the European Union. Uh, another thing that we need to emphasize is that uh, this, um, um, this part of the gas value chain is operated by the regulated companies, uh, by the storage system operators, uh, LNG uh, terminal operators, transmission system operators and uh, DSOs. Uh, and those companies, um, based on the three uh, liberalization packages, have been, first of all, entrusted with the, a very important task, that is to provide non-discriminatory access to their facilities and um, enhance their competi competition in the EU gas market. Uh, and um, in majority of cases, there are unbundled companies, which in practice means they cannot own the gas that they ship, which uh, leaves them without the biggest incentive to reduce methane emissions. Uh, apart from that, uh, the Green European Deal uh, clearly changes the balance within the triangle of the EU energy policy, so, which is based on the competitiveness, uh, sustainability and security. And uh, now uh, we can we see that uh, um, this uh, balance um, is more towards uh, sustainability. So I think this is one uh, important factor that we should into account, uh, take into account uh, when uh, talking about the regula potential regulations for uh, European companies, and I believe that those regulators, uh, regulated companies, would play a major role in reducing uh, methane emissions in the in the European Union. Uh, I fully agree with the proposal suggested by Acer and Sear and the paper, the paper Bridge Beyond 2025, uh, which uh, says that uh, the, the com regulated companies should monitor and report uh, their emissions based on the standardized uh, the, um, um, methodology. Uh, and uh, that they should uh, should propose the program uh, that they want to implement in order to reduce their emissions, uh, and then report uh, the, the emissions to the EU um, methane, uh, European Methane Observatory. Uh, this is, uh, I think, this is a very good uh, starting point. Uh, if I can propose something uh, from my side, I would add uh, some sort of uh, targets for the companies. It could be EU-wide targets to reduce emissions, or it could be, for example, the sectorial targets for, for example, different targets for TSOs and DSOs, just to recognize that those companies are, are different. Um, that, that, I think, is uh, the, the system that is already in place in Mexico, uh, and I think this is something that uh, could, we could also um, think of uh, for the European Union. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Uh, there was a question about from Damien again about methane strategy. Well, uh, he says it's not in the works plan. Well, perhaps uh, you will never come with it. No, he was not. He was just saying, well, what to expect? And I think you answer you said already, but just to confirm, this methane strategy will be presented. And then there is what what would be your reaction to things that uh, Tanya, Poppy, uh, yes, and Maria thank you. said. Well, Indeed, it is the uh, methane strategy is not in the work program, so which is the annex, but in the main body of the uh, of the Green Deal, it is mentioned, and actually it's mentioned in two places. One of them um, in relation or in relation to uh, decarbonizing the uh, the gas market. So a methane strategy will be delivered, and we are already working on it. Um, hopefully, it will be done uh, before the before mid year. And the other. Um, Another point where methane emissions are mentioned is actually under energy diplomacy. So this is something that we need to highlight uh, whenever we uh, have energy dialogues uh, or energy diplomacy actions uh, with other countries or under multilateral fora. So methane emissions will also be uh, uh, form an integral part of um, those, uh, those actions. And just to react to the uh, to the comments, um, I would uh, highlight actually, uh, and the question was also who is writing the strategy. The methane strategy uh, has been identified as have, uh, that it needs to focus on energy-related methane emissions, 
as uh, methane emissions from uh, other sectors have been already uh, or are being dealt with uh, under other tools uh, already. So at this time, and it will be DG Energy then uh, the one delivering um, the strategy. So I would like to then react to a few of the points. Um, innovation, dynamic uh, regulation or dynamic approach, uh, I fully agree with, with that. Um, there needs to be a freedom and there needs to be an incentive uh, to, uh, uh, towards innovation when it comes to measuring and detecting uh, methane emissions. Um, there was also a question whether there, need, there, there would be one methodology supported for everything in the energy sector or there should be a differentiation between the, the value chain elements. Uh, I mean, the different infrastructure pieces, they are actually different in nature. The, the main sources of emissions can come from different uh, places, uh, even within those installations or pieces of infrastructure. There needs to be a best available technology for each of those. So it will be different. You will not use the same, exactly the same uh, tools in uh, offshore platforms or around the uh, gas storage facility. So that needs to be uh, needs to be um, adaptable, dynamic, and the companies themselves would uh, uh, would be able or should be able to uh, determine which of those are the best. And yes, innovation should be uh, promoted. So whenever there is a new uh, technology coming up that is more, more cost efficient than the previous one or increases the, cer the certainty and the accuracy of the, the measurements and quantification, then uh, that, that should be uh, promoted. Uh, and um, the other uh, point that was mentioned also or brought up by uh, Maria and also in one of the comments, um, currently the, uh, the OGMP framework, so the uh, reporting framework has been designed by and for uh, the upstream. The upstream is uh, not regulated from an energy market point of view. However, when we want to push or would like to implement um, uh, a similar framework or adapt a similar framework for uh, mid and downstreamers, those are, pure, uh, those are regulated businesses. And yes, in that, in that sense, we have to explore what are the uh, regulatory incentives that could also help these companies to uh, implement um, uh, methane reduction uh, measures, uh, meet, uh, detecting uh, measurement, uh, as well as abatement of those measures. Thank you, Monica. Uh, there have been co quite a question. Uh, so uh, there have been question from Cyril directly addressed to Tanya, and uh, and then I think the next question from Carlos is more or less going in the same direction. So Tanya, and then for Poppy, there are two questions I would like uh, from Tatu and from Matthew, and from Carlos Aguero, I would ask Maria to answer. So it is a uh, uh, well, we have still roughly ten minutes. So, uh, Matania. We have seen that, for example, the oil and gas climate initiative, they have already set their methane uh, intensity target for 2025. And so what I, what I was mentioning is that perhaps the companies, so the, there are already some companies in Europe where they have already set their own targets for the, for the next year, so for 2023, 25, and 2030. So depending on the company, the targets are different. And once the companies do their internal analysis, so we could explore the possibility of having a sectorial target or a, or, or a target per segment. So it's, um, as I also mentioned, so in Marcogas we are developing a guidelines uh, just to facilitate uh, to the companies that want to, to set the, their own methane emissions reduction target. So this document will be available very soon. And once we have all this information, we could see and we could explore whether, for in our case, it's better to have an absolute or, or an intensity methane emission reduction target. Uh, Poppy, on Tatu's question and Matthew's question, Tatu basically says that Norway, Russia is doing well according to you, to, to Tropomomy uh, picture. And then also, it's a direct question to another one from Matthew. So, 
tap Please. into your question on Norway specifically. My science colleagues have finished doing flights over the Norwegian continental shelf um, this summer and autumn, and we expect the first results to be peer reviewed and published um, probably later this year towards autumn. It depends on when the, public, the scientific publications will um, prepare the papers for publication. On Russia, so we don't know. None of our teams have been able to access Russia, but we know from consultants and engineering firms who work in, in Russia that the picture is not without its problems. Um, so I do not have any answer on Russia, and I don't know why Tropomi doesn't see anything in Russia. It could be that they're doing a great job. Um, I've also heard that the Russian installation's GPS coordinates are a state secret and cannot be traced by satellites. Um, I guess we'll soon have to find out. To Matthew's question about uh, how to address discrepancies between top-down and bottom-up quantification methods, I think that's an excellent question. Um, we are trying to understand, so first of all, EDF believes that to have a, an accurate picture of the scale of the problem, we need to, we need both. We need to reconcile the, the quantification methods, the bottom-up and, and top-down, because they do different jobs. They are strong in different types of areas. So in terms of bottom-up, we can detect equipment. It can offer actionable information to operators. But the bottom-up, the top-down approaches can really help us see and prioritize what are the main um, areas for intervention, both at the industry level, at the company level, but also at the regulator and policymaker level, and, and especially investors. So with that in mind, um, we are currently in the pre-launch phase of methane stack, and so what we're doing is to learn the main user needs. We are trying to learn what kind of information they need, and we are trying to learn how they want this information to be served to them in a way that it will allow them to act. So we are currently talking with some, in the European context, we are talking with some of the main national ministries and national regulators. We are talking to the European, um, to ACER. Uh, we are talking with investors, some prominent investors who are having still quite large position in, in, in oil and gas. We are talking to civil society leaders. We are talking to industry. And we are talking to international organizations that we believe um, could have influence over this issue, including the WMO um, and the European Space Agency. So this is how we're trying. We don't actually have a response that's kind of there. We're going, the approach we're using is to understand the user needs first and then develop the product, the information products. The important thing to know is that to make sure that we don't slow down, we are hiring uh, scientists and software specialists who are going to develop information products. So MethaneSat, I think what's probably new is that MethaneSat is not only going to make data over the global um, scale, the global picture of methane emissions from oil and gas available for free, it will also deliver some basic kind of information products that could enable fast action you know, among regulators, investors, governments, companies. Yeah, Poppy. The Falka put a question about this. He just repeats what was your, I think you already said. Uh, gray areas means that they have been no emissions or we have no data or we have not information. What, what is the right answer? I really don't know what the right answer Can I? is. I think <laughs> you will know more in 2000. Uh, gray areas on the Tropomi. I mean, the Tropomi instrument uh, is able to pick up methane emissions when it sees uh, the uh, the area, so there are no clouds, for example. So through this run, probably those areas were cloudy, so the data has not been picked up. But that doesn't mean that there are no methane emissions. Okay, so the instruments will be continued to be used. So we have limited time, uh, Maria. Should the NRAs recognize the cost for downstream if there is investment to limit uh, so methane emissions or not? The answer should be yes. 
<laughs> but um, just to, to nuance it a little bit, um, so this proposal to uh, so for the regulators to recognize the cost uh, of the methane abatement um, comes from also from uh, Acer and uh, CO paper, uh, and um, I, I think that uh, it's uh, it's um, it, it's co correct, uh, right? It, it is like the methane abatement technologies um, will create some additional cost for those companies, uh, and as they are regulated. Um, it should be included in the, the tariff, but uh, I also think that um, maybe we should also think how to help regulators to assess whether the costs as um, estimates suggested by the companies are um, correct. Uh, co uh, correct. Uh, I think that maybe there should be some, um, some guidance coming from the European Commission regarding the um, best available technologies, but also inc uh, including the cost assessment and the potential payback period uh, regarding uh, certain technologies. Uh, to conclude the debate, I would make three points, I think important points. One, whoever is now in energy sector, particularly with gas and oil, should really take care about methane emissions. You can't avoid whatever uh, place in uh, value chain you are. Second, I think there is a general agreement between policy makers and industry that methane emissions could be uh, the emissions could be reduced very rapidly. They could be ambitious. So that is also. And third, what we heard also from Monica, EU assumed to take it is a low hanging fruit for 2030. So that's my conclusion for you. Whoever is in this, now it's the right time really to come out how you see you EU should legislate in this respect. And there could be very different approaches. Uh, sometimes some are more efficient, some are less. But this issue, I think, now comes very top on the EU agenda. So that's why I would really would encourage you really to look upon these issues very, very seriously, because it's now not secondary issue, but I would say one of the primary issues that is in the EU energy sector, because we see where we go. We have a lot of information, and basically action is being required. And I would like to conclude with a personal question to all of the participants on it. Uh, climate change definitely is not only methane emission reduction, it's broader. And I ask each of you to say one thing that you believe that is the most critical in really to achieve the global climate change uh, goals. I will start with Poppy and then I will go to Monica, Maria and Tanya. So, Poppy. so Andres, I think my answer at the global level would be more conceptual. Um, I think we need humility to understand to understand how our consumption footprint is driving a lot of, of the problem. So humility over the scale of the problem and humility over how little each, each one of us individually can achieve. Um, so more collaboration and more understanding that there's a lot we don't know and that we need each other to kind of uh, solve problems. So the oil and gas industry and civil society and government and investors, we all should work towards the same direction. Um, well, I would Thank be you, a Monica. bit more personal. Um, first of all, no excuses. I wouldn't want to hear excuses from anyone not to deal with climate change. Uh, and the other one is look at your own backyard. So everybody should start to look at what they can do in their own backyard before uh, starting to tell others what to do. I would say the cold face Maria? out deadline in all countries. Thank you. So, Tanya? Switching traditional fuels to, to gas as gas enables energy efficiency, contributes to the reduction of, of GSG emissions, and also improves air quality. Well, our time has run out. Uh, I would like to thank you all the panelists. I very much appreciated. I hope also it was good for the audience. We have not got so many questions, but uh, uh, I think you have been very clear in your presentations, and I hope that uh, all the participants got uh, some insights how the issue of methane emissions reduction is moving on. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the participants, you. and bye have bye. a nice day.